a structure, right? I mean, if you notice, it's actually quite unique among all atoms. In, this, in, the, in the center, its positive charge is very, very displaced from its negative charges. It's why order is actually very, very special. Now, um, if you look at this thing and you realize, well, okay, there's, there's many ways I can sort of just sort of stack these things around, but, you know, one particular way is, imagine I just had something, you know, I just sort of can arrange water uh, in this manner. It's something that sort of has a very pleasing symmetry associated with it, right? I mean, this is certainly one way to pack water molecules on top of another, and so on and so forth. So, you've experienced water viscerally in this state. Um, it's simply ice. Um, but you also experience water when it's just sort of, you know, sort of randomly packed in no particular way. I mean, there's still kind of, it's still sort of, you know, equally bumped up against other. There's no discernible symmetry associated with this. Uh, but you also experience water uh, as water vapor, where it's just sort of, you know, sort of molecules sort of flying around with absolutely no, um, um, absolutely no sort of order associated with it. So the first thing we realize is that water can organize itself in increasing states of disorder, but as it does so, it loses a large amount of symmetry. And this is very fundamental to all of physics. Uh, different states of matter are really classified in terms of the different symmetries that they express. And in fact, it's one of the deepest things about physics, uh, I would say, the, the universe as a whole, that uh, the stuff that it's made up of is actually kind of irrelevant. What's really fundamental about the universe is the expression of symmetry. All of particle physics is based on uh, Einstein realizing that the world looks the same no matter how you move is an expression of symmetry. And that can pin down the laws of physics without even knowing what anything is made up of. So different states of matter correspond to different states of symmetry. And so snowflakes, you know, seem to have this very pleasing triangular symmetry that scales up into hexagonal symmetry. Um, liquid water seems to have no discernible symmetry and water vapor even less so. Um, but different states of matter, and this is a universal fact, okay, and it, and it didn't really care about the fact that water was made up of this strange molecule with sort of three points. Uh, it could have been made up of anything. Most things are sometimes a solid, sometimes a liquid, sometimes a gas. Okay? So you learn something about uh, why that is, right? Why isn't the universe full of millions of different types of states of matter? Well, they're not. It's because there's only a finite number of ways in which symmetries express themselves in three dimensions. And so transitions between these different states of, of symmetry can often be very, very violent. Uh, and what it's really, what the stuff is actually telling you is that we have different ways of organizing ourselves. When we go from one thing to another, there's a rupture. And things, uh, you know, things, you know, things, lots of energy is released. There's all sorts of violent sort of uh, catastrophic things that can happen. And the most incredible thing, I think, about the structure of matter in the universe is the gap, the sort of the, the, the sort of the transitions, the dislocations, the phase transitions. Have a very remarkable property. The universe is full of all sorts of stuff, but there's only a handful of phase transitions in the universe. Stuff looks exactly the same in a lot of ways when it goes between these different transitions. There's a universality class of things that appear, and the way physicists like to sort of, uh, sort of, you know, conceive of this is that they like to write down a thing called an order parameter. Now, this is a very, this is a very, this can be a very mathematically abstract concept, but the idea is there's a thing called an order parameter, and as it gets bigger and bigger, the system heads into a more and more of a disordered state. Now, why am I going through all of this for you? So, first of all. You know uh, a lot about water uh, every time you boil uh, some water to make a kettle of uh, pot of tea. Uh, you're seeing a phase transition at work here, right? So there's, there's water that's trying to exist in a particular phase, and then suddenly water decides that it's energetically more favorable to be a gas. There's a bubble that appears out of nowhere, and then 
eventually it sort of takes over and then water sort of boils off. I'd like to inform you that in fact the creation of the universe was exactly this process. There was a phase transition in the early universe and there was an order parameter associated with a field that we call the inflaton field. Uh, I could give an entire other uh, discussion about that, but I won't. Um, and this thing sort of uh, is responsible for the creation of the universe. So just like how when a bubble nucleates out of a phase of water and inside is gas and there's a bunch of free energy that's sort of released, in the context of cosmology, that free energy is the stuff that made us up. Okay? And, and the way it happened is mathematically identical to water boiling. So, um, and then as the universe's history progresses, a bunch of symmetries kept getting broken. And we start out with the universe sort of in, some, in this sort of weird, diffuse goop called the quark gluon plasma. And then it turned into stuff that we actually experience a bit more uh, terrestrially, like you know, protons and electrons. And all of that eventually condensed into the scaffolding on which our galaxies are. So, so we are not even a pixel. On a, our galaxy is not even a pixel on this thing. It's an extremely large scale part of the universe. And it's just literally like taking a bowl of soup and cooling it until these weird, stringy, cheesy things form. Um, it's not an accident that the structure of the universe at very large scales looks something familiar to you. Okay? The universe is a lazy place. It repeats mathematics again and again and again, uh, all over the place. So, to get back to the question, what is disorder, and posing the counterfactual, what is order, we see that the universe sort of is nothing but an expression of how symmetries express themselves. That's it. If there's anything fundamental to physics, it's symmetries and the breaking of them. But this really begs the question, why does anything happen at all? Why did any of this even happen? So, um, the funny thing about the laws of physics is that they are symmetric, right? So like, if, I, if the laws of physics are exactly the same over here as they are over here, as they are in the Andromeda galaxy, as they are anywhere in the universe, the, the, the universe doesn't care which way I look at it. The universe seems to not care about how I look at things. And at the subatomic level, it doesn't even care about which way you, you're, you're looking at the film. You know, if you have like a, if you have, you know, a particle, you know, bouncing off of another particle, you know, you can always rewind that film and, and go backwards, you know, and it looks the same, everything is the same. So then, why is it that time is this funny direction that always seems to go in one direction, right? Well, I can go left and right, why can't I go forwards and backwards in time at will, if particles, can, if particles can do exactly the same thing? Well, uh, nobody knows. Okay? This is still a question we're trying to understand. But we have a pretty good guess, or there are sort of ideas that are floating around. And it's the kind of thing when, you know, um, after a conference, after we've smoked enough weed and drank enough wine you sit down and talk about is why, why time has an arrow. And I hope by the end of the next five minutes you will have some idea as to, as to why that might be. So you're in a gallery right now, I'm going to transport you into a classroom uh, and this is going to be a, a introduction to thermodynamics but in a way that is very visual and I think you will all understand. So I'm inviting you to be physicists with me. I'm inviting you to think about a box. It could be this room. And this box is full of stuff. Let's say gas. The simplest thing you can come up with. Just sort of atoms pinging around. But let's be even simpler and you know, imagine that there were only 20 sort of... Uh, there's a... So now I have... We were at this one. This one is in here. Okay, so I have a box where I have 20 atoms and I'm going to try and arrange them in these sort of 20s and these different substances. Of course, you know, atoms can exist in a continuum anywhere around, but imagine I only could put them um, in one of these boxes. So let me, let me put this forward. I describe order as something where, you know, it's taken a lot of work to sort of... So if I, if I put everything here, I've got 20 atoms, and I all put them on the top left-hand box. You would say that that's quite an order. So, 
uh, you walk into a kid's room, if everything's in a corner, you're like, hmm, good, it's a new room. If it's sort of spread around everywhere, it's a bit more uh, chaotic, right? So, uh, but notice something. That's very unlikely, right? It's, uh, uh, if these things are free to wander around, it's very unlikely that they'll just sort of end up there. So if we ask the question, how many ways in which we can take 20 atoms and put them all in the top right-hand box, the top left-hand box, so if they're all on the top left, well, there's only one way to do it. Okay? But now I imagine I take one and I put it in a, you know, in a random different other location. Well, you can quickly see that there's 19 ways of doing it. And if I were to do that to two of them, there's 190. And if I were to do that to three, so now I'm like really scattering these things around, you see that there's actually 1,159. I mean, you can figure this out, it's not very enlightening. And if so on and so forth. So very quickly, the number of ways to arrange things where they're not in one corner really quickly blows up. So if they're all equal, as far as the energetics of the process is concerned, which setup are you most likely to end up in? You're going to end up in the one that's the most disordered. Okay? So um, you're more likely to walk in into a situation where things are sort of left like this and find things sort of spread around. You know, you, like the gas in this room is uniformly everywhere. It's not just in a corner. So this concept has a very deep uh, 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 meaning in physics. The number of ways in which a system can exist is the entropy okay. well it's in fact the exponential of this but, um, and systems always head towards situations of maximum entropy disorder is something that is always increasing irreversibly not because the laws of physics are irreversible but just because there's many more ways to be messy than there are to be clean. So this is entropy, it really is. Um, and the, the mathematical expression of it is uh, if I call the number of ways in which a system can exist omega, and if something proportional to something, well, this is the only equation I'll throw at you, this is one of the most fundamental equations in all of physics. That entropy is the number of ways in which a system can exist. And as you can tell, there's something very, very deep about this. Entropy always increases. Always increases, statistically, on average, across the universe. And so, um, you think, oh, well, okay, well, hold on a second, that can't be true. Um, now imagine, like, you know, the gas is everywhere. Let me sort of pick them all and put them back into this top right-hand box. We try and reduce the entropy. Well, okay, I've reduced the entropy in this box, but by doing that, I've created more entropy outside of the box. Okay? We are entropy machines. Um, this is what an air conditioner does when it cools down a room. Although it might be cooler inside the room, it's creating more heat outside. The entropy of the universe is always increasing. Always. And some people think this is what gives time its arrow. Is this fact. Right? This is the only thing in physics that we can see, picks out a direction in, in time. Uh, it's asymmetric. Uh, we are made up of atoms that you know, have chemical processes associated with it, and, and our biological ticking uh, of all sort of organic processes go in the direction of increasing entropy. So maybe this is why we see time going forward, but if you were some electron, you didn't care. The universe looks time symmetric to you. Um, and then, there's something else that's about to happen, which is, well, um, if the entropy is always increasing as the system is trying to find its most disordered state, eventually, we're going to hit some sort of a maximum. Right? The universe is just what it is. Um, eventually, the universe is going to become so disordered that we're going to actually reach the maximum state of entropy. And that is actually going to happen. That's in our future. It's called the heat death of the universe. Nothing can happen at that point. That is effectively the end of our useful universe. 
as we know it. Um, and so if we're always creating disorder, there's a limit, and that limit is reached when all of the available, you know, useful energy is now democratically distributed among everything that there is out there. And at that moment, nothing can happen in the universe ever again. And that moment is when the universe is, you get this right, is heat death. Of the universe happens when the universe is, you ready for this? 10 to the 10 to the 120 years. Okay, so now I'm going to unpack that number for you. Um, 10 to the 120, well, um, 10 to the anything, let's say 5, is 1 followed by 5 zeros. So 10 to the 120 is 1 followed by, you guessed it, 120 zeros. Okay? There are 10 to the 82 atoms in the universe. That's it. Well, it's a bar. I can't even write this number down if I put a zero on every atom in the universe. I could not even write this number down. Um, but I can express it abstractly in that, in that following form. So when the universe becomes this old, nothing else will happen. We reach a state of maximum disorder. Time's arrow stops going forward. We reach time invariance again. And then most likely some quantum fluctuation will start the universe again in another big bang. But, um, but as you can see, we have plenty of time left to continue making disorder in the universe around us. So that's all I have to tell you. Thank you very much.